This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. There's an old proverb that states, if you have only two pennies, spend the first on bread and the other on hyacinths for your soul. This quote has been used many times by proponents of the performing arts in our schools and in our communities. Here along the Gulf Coast, the arts are thriving in a veritable garden of hyacinths for our souls. The State of the Arts Part 1 is coming up next on the latest edition of In Studio. Most would agree that art of all kinds is just what the proverb stated, the hyacinth for our souls, the essence that makes up the quality of our lives. Even Albert Einstein seemed to agree. He once said, logic will get you from A to B, imagination will take you everywhere. On this edition of In Studio Part One of our series on the arts, we'll learn firsthand about the state of the performing arts in our area. We'll be talking with many friends from many of the major arts organizations in Pensacola, the Pensacola Children's Chorus, Ballet Pensacola, Friends of the Sanger and the upcoming Broadway season, as well as the Pensacola Symphony Orchestra. So we have a lot of arts to cover, and so we're going to get right to it. And first up, we'll talk with the Pensacola Children's Chorus. So since 1990, the chorus has been at the forefront of performing in the U.S. and all over the world. Home-based right here in Pensacola, the PCC has nurtured the artistic creativity of thousands of young performers, producing movies and television actors, Broadway leads, opera stars, and recording artists. They've also touched so many lives with the joy of music, dance, and friendship. Joining us to talk about the children's chorus this evening, Alex Gartner. He's the new artistic director of the Pensacola Children's Chorus. A native of Cincinnati, Ohio, he's previously served as the assistant director of the Cincinnati Children's Choir, and that's one of the leading children's choral organizations in the nation. He has extensive experience in church music, Music, musical theater, and nonprofit arts management. And also Linda Brent. She's the president and CEO of the Asta Group, a business strategy consulting firm with clients across the U.S. Linda serves as the board president of the Pensacola Children's Chorus, in which all three of her children have been members. So a warm welcome to both of you. And I also want to tell everybody that I do love the arts. I've worked with a number of the people that are on the show today, and I am president emeritus of the Friends of the Sanger as well. So um, support it, but I'm not paid by any arts organizations at all. <laughs> so it's just it's just a thing that I love about our community. Welcome again Thank to you. both Thank of you. Thank you for having us. So glad you're here. Lynn, I want to talk about, um, you've been involved now in, in kind of what's been happening and, and how we're moving forward now. So let's talk about this past year was quite incredible. Yes, it was a very incredible year. Our founding directors, Susan and Alan Pote, um, decided early on in the last season that they were going to retire. And uh, we knew it was coming somewhere down the road. We didn't expect it to come quite so quickly. <laughs> um, but they have provided such a wonderful foundation for children's arts in this community. Um, finding uh, someone to replace them we, we knew would be a challenge. But in that stead, uh, we did have a formal search committee. We involved members of the community, the arts community, and we were very blessed to find um, Alex Gardner. He has, he has already just been a joy to the community, a joy to the chorus. Um, it's it's been a pleasure to to have him here, and the Potes um, gave us their blessing, and uh, we're very excited, and have continued to be very supportive, and for that, we're forever grateful. And so, Alex, you started July first. Welcome to Pensacola. Thank you. What drew you to this area? Oh wow! Um, I had vacationed down here as a boy, and uh, with my family, and the opportunity to serve an arts organization like this wonderful Pensacola Children's Chorus just just was magnetic to me. And so uh, it was a very simple decision, and uh, it happened so quickly. It <laughs> feels like it was just yesterday. Well, and it was in the spring. I remember a lot of people were meeting with you, and, mm -hmm. and so the, the chorus had a lot of input, and you had a chance to really kind of get to know the area before even having to make that decision. Absolutely, yes. Um, the interview process started in February, and I spent several weekends down here meeting students and parents and community leaders. Leaders, and uh, 
I just really fell in love and it made the decision very easy. So um, you are going to come in and, and you have some big shoes to fill, but you seem completely up for the challenge. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm putting on a good front. Huh? Um, no, the uh, the Potes have laid such a wonderful foundation for this organization. Um, we have such dedicated kids and families and they're so incredibly talented. Um, it makes stepping into something like this um, very painless and and seamless. And I've been able to continue my dialogue with many community leaders and parents um, and students to kind of shape the vision for the future going forward. There's a lot of opportunity here in this area and within our organization, so we've got some great plans ahead. I know you don't want to spill all the beans <laughs> um, right now, but um, I, I, I get the feeling that there may be some more community outreach and involving more people. Am I kind of just... You are on the right track. Okay. We, uh, we did a really hard look at, at kind of our community within the chorus and our relationship with our community outside. So we're doing a lot of stuff both internally with our students to really um, strengthen the ties of teamwork um, that that choruses generally can provide just by their nature. And we're also looking to continue to partner with our arts organizations in Pensacola. Um, this year alone, we're working with the Symphony and University of West Florida. Um, and also the Opera Company as well um, on, on some collaborations there. And uh, we're also starting to lay some groundwork for a regional choir program where we plant some, in some key areas, smaller, cor cor sorry, smaller choruses mm -hmm. um, that will combine for our major performances. Wow, that is great. Yeah. Give more people opportunity Absolutely. to reach out there. So uh, Linda, what are you seeing um, as the future of the children's chorus with this, with this new day dawning? It's a very exciting time. Um, as you know, we launched an endowment in the spring, um, and that will carry us forward into the future. You know, so we're on a very strong financial footing um, from the perspective of our artistic direction. I think we're in a very strong footing there as well. And Alex's uh, intent to be more community-based and, and more inclusive of the community and participating in the community, I think is key to make us really a part of that future going forward. Um, as we look to the idea of community choruses or community choirs and extending ourselves out, you know, a large majority of our, of our children or, uh, receive financial aid, and we really believe that any child who wants the opportunity to sing and become part of this kind of an organization, we will find a way to make it happen, and that's really what we want to do going forward. So the endowment and the financial base is important and key to us continuing that. Well, we're getting a little short on time, and I want to get in all the points, but as a mom, I want you to take off that business hat for a minute. <laughs> You've had three kids in the chorus. Yes. What has that meant to you as a family, as, as a part of the community? You know, what they learned in terms of leadership, in terms of discipline, in terms of just stage presence and um, being able to be in front of people and comfortable with that uh, has just been amazing. Um, I have two children who just started last night again with, um, with the high school choruses and um, they're just so excited about the year ahead. They said at times they were laughing so much they couldn't <laughs> sing. So they're having a great time. But as a mom, it's just, it, it's, it's nice to see that part of their soul kind of being exposed. I'm so happy for all the kids that, that get to be in that. Now, Alex, let's talk about um, when the kid, you've got so many, can you actually train <laughs> them? I mean, I know you can train them to dance and sing the songs, but can they actually get some, some vocal training while they're in a group that large? Absolutely, you know what, everything that we do in our rehearsals is based on this healthy foundational vocal technique. That's what's kind of drew me to this organization specifically because it combines the traditional choral experience and the musical theater aspect, but in a healthy way. Sometimes those two avenues compete, and we don't want that. Um, and so what they gain in addition to all that character building that Linda just described is they gain a great solid vocal foundation that can carry them you know, in, in any career. That's so. wonderful, and I was going to say, not everybody has to be a Broadway lead, or Absolutely. I mean, they it could teach them to what be a CEO and get up in front of. Absolutely, the 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 skills of discipline, responsibility, commitment, all those things translate to every single career field, and some of the. Um, some of my friends who have done choruses growing up uh, who are in very successful positions attribute that to having a strong choral background, to having that, that experience. 
And that discipline yeah. and that learning, how yeah. wonderful. Exactly. Let's talk about this uh, big season that you have Yes, planned. big season. <laughs> yes, you're going to be busy. And I, I believe we've got a, a board that lists out the different shows that we have coming up. But tell mm -hmm. us about the shows that are... Well, we are doing our, our same three main stage performances that the chorus has historically done in the past several years. Uh, Christmas on the Coast is our first one, December 9th through 11th. Um, we just started that music this week, and uh, it's going to be exactly what this community remembers. Glitz and glam and all the fun holiday experience. Um, One World Many Voices is on February 26th. That is our more traditional concert. It features a guest conductor. Um, her name is Janet Galvan. She comes from Ithaca, New York. And then Showtime, our musical theater review, is on May 5th through 7th. And that's all your favorite musical theater classics. All of, all of these performances are held at the Sanger Theater, which we're happy to call home. And, uh, we're looking forward to a great season. I think it's going to be fantastic, and I see that uh, subscriptions are still available. Yes, for another couple weeks, so we encourage you. That's the first time we've ever done that before, mm -hmm. and we're very excited about that. So you can buy for the whole season and uh, become a part of the life of the chorus. So we've got about two minutes. Are there some things that you want to share with our audiences that, um, that you're particularly? I know we've talked about some of the things that you're looking forward to doing, but will you add in new shows or different shows? Or um, We're looking to really increase our community presence within our performances. We actually are getting ready to launch a new choir in our organization, the Ambassador Choir, and it's going to be a small group of about 16 voices um, tasked with going into the community to sing at smaller events, larger events. Um, we're, we're trying to get our presence um, more known and that we can spread this wonderful message of community um, and strengthen this arts community in Pensacola. We're also um, partnering with our local teachers. We're creating a teacher advisory board. Uh, we want to really strengthen our relationships with our school system because we know that the training that the kids get in their choral classroom at school enhances our rehearsals and everything they get in our rehearsals enhances their training at school. So we want to create an avenue and a, and a forum for teachers to give their input to where our program should and can go. Excellent. And Linda, as uh, funding, we, we're short on time, but as funding has been cut in so many areas in the arts, why do you think it's important that we have the arts and continue to do this for our children? The arts are critical for the future, you know, for all the reasons that we talked about, um, you know, to create that love of learning, that love of the arts, it just makes you a better well-rounded person and training children um, to experience that early on is key. Well, they, um, the community can certainly see you at the Sanger Theater and out and about, and, and I, I know you've done a lot to work with the other arts organizations in town, and it's a, it's a new day and a great day to be living in Pensacola. Absolutely. It is. We welcome you again, and thank we you. thank you for all your hard work. Well, thank you for As highlighting well. the arts. We Absolutely. really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, well, coming up, we'll be joined by Richard Steinert and two featured soloists with Ballet Pensacola. You're watching in studio on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. last time you needed to know, there wasn't this or this. When the last hurricane hit our state, we were there. And today, we're still here. But we're also here. Introducing Florida Storms, a free mobile app from the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network, built just for Florida. With content from the National Hurricane Center and National Weather Service, Florida Storms will alert you to any weather hazard that may threaten you or your family. Florida Storms, download it today.
watching in studio on WSRE, and tonight we're discussing the state of the arts in our area. We're moving from the children's chorus now to ballet. We're so happy to be joined by some of the key players with Ballet Pensacola. Richard Steiner now entering his 10th season with the organization. He's the artistic director and general manager. Now, Steiner has held the attention of the ballet and arts community through a series of critically acclaimed performances and projects. In 2013, Richard Steiner was appointed membership to the International Dance Council, SID UNESCO, is that right? That's correct. SID UNESCO, the highest international body for dance for his contributions to the global dance community, both choreographically and educationally. Also, Jasmine Rutherford entering her third season with the company. Jasmine also hails from Cincinnati. She recently <laughs> received her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ballet Performance from the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. And soloist Josiah White, who began his ballet training at age 10, dancing at New Paltz School of Ballet in New New York. He was that right? Yes. Ma yes. Okay. Good. I thought so. He danced with numerous companies across the country in their summer intensives before joining Ballet Pensacola three years ago. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so for having us. Thank you. Hi. So glad that you could be here. So <laughs> really, too. truly glad. Now, amazing energy here. Just, <laughs> just here, and they don't even they don't even have on dancing shoes. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, well, oh, well. They're, and they're happy about that for the moment. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> we'll be going back and putting them on in a minute. I'm but, sure yeah. you will. I'm sure you will. And so how do you find people like this? Well, um, Dancers yeah, like this. The, <laughs> Amazing there, there are two things that I think that are really important, mm -hmm. and it's the repertoire. You know, we do at Ballet Pensacola about 90% of it are, are new works. So we attract young dancers who want to be in new works. And um, then we also do, an, we do a national audition tour every year of about 10 cities around the, the country. And I look at dancers and, um, you know, and you find them. And sometimes as I come to you, Josiah came to us um, from Austin Ballet. It was um, CCM in Cincinnati where I mm -hmm. found Jasmine. And you know, you know, yeah. you walk in and I knew right away, you know, I stopped looking at her at the early early in the audition because I knew I was going to hire her. She didn't know that. Though. No. <laughs> but, um, you made her a, work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep them, keep them on your toes. Yeah. No pun intended. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are plenty of puns, I'm yeah. sure, we, oh, yeah. we could go through. But now you've got an extensive background in dance. I, I do. You know, you live long enough and mm -hmm. it's just going to happen. So, yeah, I've been, been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. I started working... Um, in theater when I was was very young and um, you know came up um, through Hartford Ballet and uh, Joffrey danced for Bob Fosse on Broadway and um, Atlanta Ballet where I met my wife Christine who is the ballet mistress at Ballet Pensacola mm -hmm. and um, so uh, I've been fortunate though I much prefer directing to performing. I'm well, much happier um, this side of the stage. Or that yeah. side of the camera, whichever and the case yes. may be. Yeah, exactly. Yes, so exactly. now you're entering your 10th year. Something how new. have... How did you find things when you got here? <laughs> how, did, how do you see that they have evolved to this point? And kind of where do you see us going? Well, you know, when they hired me, um, I was coming off of a directorship in Hartford, Connecticut, with Ballet Theater in Hartford. And um, they hired me here to start a professional company because there wasn't one yet. They had a great training academy and um, asked me if I thought I could do it. I'd done it before, and I like the challenge idea of it. And um, it was easier than I thought it would be in a lot of ways, mostly because of such a dedicated group that we have on our board of directors who made it possible for me to get to know the city pretty quickly, mm -hmm. <laughs> get to know some of the key players as quickly as possible, and then just sort of set me free and let me do the ballets because, you know, it all comes down to those ballets. Mm -hmm. and, and they just... They provided the funding, they set me free, and they said, to go go make us a season. And it started, we did one season, and the next by the next season we had hired our first group of professionals. And it's just grown every year. The first year it was just four professionals, and you know, we've had up to 17. This year's a little smaller. We've cut down a little bit just because of the season. And, um, but, uh, so it's just continued to grow, and I feel 
so fortunate. <laughs> well, I was going to say to these dancers here, how fortunate are you as well? I mean, he's fortunate, you're yeah. fortunate, we're fortunate, but um, when you met Richard, or okay, I'm going to start with Josiah, because <laughs> you went and you actually went to Richard, you found him, or you found the ballet. Mm. Tell us your story. And I, the year after I graduated high school, I went to Ballet Austin Summer Intensive, uh, where I met Dustin Simmons. He grew up in, uh, native Pensacola, and, um, and he's danced with the company for who knows how long. Uh, oh, wow. I know. And he, yeah. He, yeah, he and I hit it off, um, and then I went back home and went uh, did an internship, a uh, traineeship with mm -hmm. Ballet Theater of Maryland, and we were communicating. He's like, "Why don't you come audition here?" It's a really fun place. I think you. I think you would enjoy it. So I just sent my resume and a video and some pictures off to Richard. I hope he didn't watch the video because I saw it the other day and I cried a little bit on the oh, inside. Yeah. Just a little. I saw it, but I hired you anyway. Yeah. And Jasmine, <laughs> Jasmine, what about you? Um, well, I started at Cincinnati Ballet and then I went to college at the University of Cincinnati, like you said before. And uh, my junior year, Richard came in for a master class that turned into an audition. <laughs> and he's like, "Hey, does people want jobs?" Like, absolutely. We want one, and so uh, and he like he I guess he said earlier that he liked me from the beginning, and um, we uh, it turned into an audition, and he said, "Hey, can you send me your resume?" And so he's already seen me dance, so I sent him uh, my resume and a photo just to remind him what I looked mm -hmm. like. And then uh, a couple days later, I got an email saying that he wanted to hire me for the season. And that's how I found out about the company. How so, exciting! Yeah, I bet you were a little excited. Very excited. <laughs> how exciting is it to work for someone like Richard, who has such a fresh perspective? Being, uh, I mean, he, it just never gets old. There's yeah. always something new. Yeah. How does it feel? Go ahead, John. Um, Sometimes it can be frustrating because he looks at you and goes, all right, I want you to pick her up and throw her in the air and do who knows what. And uh, we do it. And then we slowly refine it down into something that has a system mm -hmm. and actually looks good from whatever mess it started. So he keeps us on our toes. <laughs> so constantly. you start them with a mess and they I, come I up with, with this refined thing. Because yeah. I, I don't choreograph before I start. Mm -hmm. I don't do anything ahead of time. I go into the studio, I put the music on, and I start, and very often I do do that. Yeah. I could take her here, put her over your left shoulder, bring her this way, and have mm -hmm. her end up this way in arabesque, and then I say, <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. Mm -hmm. And um, and and the first rehearsal, usually someone cries, but they mm -hmm. s figure it out. <laughs> and, um, and But that, for us, I think, yeah. I don't know if you would agree or not, you have to, because I'm the director. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but I think that's what makes it work at Ballet yeah, Pensacola because I, everybody has a stake in it. I can you know, agree we're not with that. just yeah. saying, Jasmine, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to hear back what they feel. Absolutely. There's a real sense of reciprocity yeah. there. And the longer they dance here, the greater sense yeah. that is, mm -hmm. you know. So. And being in Pensacola, um, how do you all feel about this, the state of the arts here? Are you kind of amazed at the size of the city and yeah. what's going on? I, I love how how welcoming they are about the arts here. Like, I feel like they're, it's very culturally, they're aware that there are so many different art forms here, and it's very centrally located, and that there's a place for that, and I really enjoy that here, which is really nice to have, from, coming from a big city, coming down here to see that. It's really awesome, I think, yeah. Well, and I think I want to say, I, I see that we have such a gem, a hidden gem in Richard, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, to, to choose this as your place of residence and put these incredible performances on is just a, a really lucky thing for us. So I want that's what I want to move on to now is about your upcoming season, because we don't have all day. I wish we did. Uh, we've got a few minutes, and we've got a board that tells what you've got coming up, but you've got a lot of stuff that sounds fairly clear. Classic, but tell us how you keep yeah. it fresh and a new spin on things. Well, this being my 10th season, mm -hmm. we sort of decided to uh, make it into a storybook season. And so we're starting the season this year with a, a brand new ballet called Wizards and Warriors that I'm choreographing, which is sort of based on the whole Harry Potter mindset. We're not really following the book, but um, for those who love the book, sure. um, you know, uh, 
And so that's an exciting thing for us because these ballets, you not really only get to, we have to build the score. <laughs> and then once I've built the score, then we have to end up choreographing it and putting the story together. And so we're really excited about that. Then um, in December, of course, is Nutcracker. Oh, and right. we change that up every year a little bit. So um, we're always pleased about that. Get your tickets now because um, <laughs> we are always sold out on that, which makes me, which makes me happy. Mm -hmm. um, then in our winter slot this year, we're doing a new Romeo and Juliet. We're using the, Proc the Prokofiev music, but I'm doing new choreography. Nice. to it. Um, so we're very excited about that. And then we're ending the season with the last storybook, which will be um, a, uh, a visual romp <laughs> <laughs> through Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. So that also is a new production. So three new full-length ballets How this year, fun. which means that, yeah, I will sleep through the entire summer next year. I bet <laughs> yes. you will. <laughs> Keep, keeping you very, very busy. Yes. And, we, and we'll get to see these. How, do, how does that process work? You, you, the casting? Yes. Um, uh, I tend to choose ballets from the dancers that I have. I tend to, you know, um, Wizards and Warriors, it's really is is sort of Josiah's ballet, he's doing the main character, he's just right for it. You know, you see people sometimes and you think, I'll do, mm -hmm. I'll do this for him, you know? Um, and uh, principal roles I tend to cast fairly early on because that way I build the ballet on, from that. on mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. but, um, more than make the dancers fit the ballets, I'm, I'd rather make the ballets fit the dancers. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it, it, it always seems to work for you. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about your perception of the state of the arts here in this area, how it relates to the rest of the world, really. Well, you know, it's easy to think that in, in, in a smaller city, that you're not gonna have the kind of arts that we have here in Pensacola. And very often that's true. You know, it's pretty remarkable here. Mm -hmm. We have a lot, and we have a lot of stability. You know, this is Peter Rubart from the symphonies. This is, I think, his 20th, 20th year. Right. This is my 10th season. Kyle from the opera has been at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. I think maybe mm -hmm. even longer than that. But yet at the same time, we have this new and exciting thing going on at the children's chorus with Alex coming in mm -hmm. and some fresh blood and, you know, and but still being respectful of what's been in the past. And then the new directorship at PLT. Um, it, it's an exciting spot. And, you know, I think we owe a lot of that to our county commissioners and our city council members who work so hard and diligently for us. Because the arts really are what's good for the city. Isn't that true? It, it's good Isn't for the city, it's, it's heads and beds, it helps recruitment mm -hmm. for the corporate end of things. You know, the arts are basic mm -hmm. and we're proud to be they part are. of that and, and we struggle to be. And we, I've, got to, I've got to wrap us, but I agree with everything you said and I thank mm -hmm. you all for coming on. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, looking forward to the upcoming season. We are discussing the state of the arts and the roles that they play in enhancing our lives and up next we'll talk with representatives of the historic Sanger Theater. You're watching in studio. WSRE Public Television and the Escambia Elementary Principals Association congratulate these Shining Star Award recipients. These students were selected upon the basis of good citizenship and adherence to the core values adopted by the Escambia County School System. Equality, responsibility, integrity, respect, honesty, and patriotism. Congratulations to all of these outstanding students.
This is in studio on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our topic, the performing arts. Our guests for this segment represent the venue many of us call the Grand Dame of Palafox, the crown jewel of Pensacola. We could go on, and I'm not biased at all. Kathy Summerlin is the marketing director of the Historic Sanger Theater, managed by SMG. Kathy has worked in marketing and PR in the entertainment industry for more than 20 years, the last 12, at our Sanger. Kathy's very active in the Pensacola community and recently graduated from the International Association of Venue Managers Management School. And Jonathan Thompson with Friends of the Sanger. Jonathan is a native of Pensacola, a graduate of FSU, and is very active in our community working with organizations such as the Symphony and Habitat for Humanity, among many others. He's an active member and past president of Pensacola Young Professionals and now serves as the president of FOS, the fundraising arm of the Sanger Theater. So welcome to both of you. So okay. glad that you, you could be here this evening. Um, let's talk about, Kathy, um, just mentioned that you've been um, doing some more training and learning more about venues around the world. Sanger just recently had some pretty amazing accolades. We, in 2015, Polestar, which is an industry magazine, ranked us 119 in the world in, among all theaters. Think about that. In Pensacola, Florida, 119 in the world, that is just a huge accomplishment for us. And, and some of those things um, are from the increase of touring shows and things like that. Uh, another publication, Venues Today, ranked us number 16 in the United States. So in theaters of 2,000 seats or below. So we are doing really well in Pensacola, um, you know, with the state of the arts and, and the touring shows that are coming to the Sanger, so. And how did they come up with those rankings? Do you know, what do they look at? They're, they're based on box office revenues and attendance. So the Polestar rating is based on um, attendance and the, um, the other one, number mm -hmm. 16 in the United States, is based on revenues. Mm -hmm. So we are, we're standing good mm -hmm. among, in, the, in our industry. And um, big Broadway season coming up that we will talk about, certainly. I do want to um, say to Jonathan that um, a, a venue of this amazing proportion could not exist without a really strong base of public support. Tell us about what Friends of the Sanger does and, and your involvement there. Right, so Friends of the Sanger has uh, been uh, around since the early 80s. It was established to support and fundraise for the theater, which of course is a city-owned venue. Um, but as you know, with, with uh, a lot of government budgets, there's, there's not a lot of wiggle room if you need money for renovation, restoration, expansion, improvements. Friends of the Sanger does a lot to fundraise for the theater. We sponsor the Broadway series. We, we put on some other great events. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization. We don't have any paid staff, so everything we do is volunteer, and, and every dollar we bring in, we plow it right back into the theater. And we love the Sanger. We realize it is a true historic landmark in, in downtown Pensacola. Uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, resource for the community, and it really is kind of the heart and soul of a lot of the culture and arts uh, within our area. So it's, it's really important to have a group like Friends of the Sanger that can advocate for the theater, uh, help with any restorations, renovations, improvements that are necessary. Uh, and, and we're happy to do it, and, and we've been around for several decades now, and of course you played a, a big role uh, over the years, and, um, and we're happy, I'm happy to help try and continue the good work. I'm so glad that you can do that. That's <laughs> wonderful. Kathy, let's talk a little bit about, Jonathan mentioned the unique relationship that we have. A lot of people that are watching really don't know, they just love the Sanger Theater, mm -hmm. but it's, it's got a kind of a, a triune type situation going on. Would you elaborate on that? Well, last year, Sanger turned 90, so we're 91 this year, and a lot of people don't understand um, where the Sanger came from. It was the Sanger Amusement Company. It was a, a group of brothers that put theaters across the Gulf Coast. They were all within a day's drive of each other for touring vaudeville shows. Um, the, once downtown started turning, um, the theater fell into disrepair. Um, it was owned by ABC Southeastern Theaters, and then it was um, sold to the city of Pensacola for a dollar. In the 70s, right? In the 70s, yes. So there was a campaign to bring it back to life. UW, UWF was a big part of that, and um, it opened back up again in 1987. And um, so the, 
1981. 81, I apologize. No, that's We're okay. coming up on the 35th <laughs> yeah. anniversary right. of the reopening. Right. Um, so the Sangers owned by the city of Pensacola and a company from Philadelphia named SMG manages it professionally for the city. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So you've got the, the city owns it, then you've got the management, then you've got the fundraising. Friends, mm -hmm. Friends of the So same. it all works together rather seamlessly. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the fact that um, we've got some really big shows coming in here. It's amazing that you can have the quality that we have here. We do. Um, just to kind of reiterate, our Broadway season, our touring Broadway shows, they're not local actors that or musicians that are performing. These are professional performers that are coming in off of Broadway. Um, and we've got some really great shows coming this year. We kick it off with Straight No Chaser, um, which is an a cappella group, and they're amazing. My favorite. <laughs> Yeah. Rudolph the Red Nosed mm -hmm. Reindeer, Chicago, Rogers and Hammerstein, Cinderella, which is beautiful. I've seen that one once, mm -hmm. which is a, a Grammy, I mean, a Tony Award winning mm -hmm. uh, musical. And then we close the season with Mamma Mia, which is a lot of people's favorite, the ABBA music, music, music based on ABBA. Well, and a different generation can come into that every year, really, and kind of learn that whole thing. It, Broadway's for everybody, mm -hmm. and we, we do have something for everybody. There, We've got the traditional classical Broadway shows, and then we've got some, some more um, fun mm -hmm. things um, for children. It's a great way for to introduce a 9- or a 10-year-old to musical theater. I hate to think what would have happened to this city had the theater not been mm -hmm. restored, because at one point there was talk of turning that area into something something else. Hmm. Do you remember? It was, it was Sure, you know, I mean, for a while there was, maybe it was going to be raised and turned into another parking lot. And, and so thankfully, um, UWF and, and some people who came together and eventually became friends of the Sanger and the city helped step in and saved that theater. Um, and then over the years, um, thanks to a lot of community philanthropists and again, friends of the Sanger, we've done some restorations, the lobby in 1995, and of course, from 2007 to 2009, the big renovation which completely redid the theater, expanded it almost um, twice, uh, mm -hmm. twice its, its uh, existing size, added a lot of um, dressing rooms, which I know a lot of the, the entertainment groups were, were happy to have those, um, and uh, meeting rooms and community rooms, and it, it just, it was a wonderful restoration. Friends of the Sanger helped raise a million dollars towards that effort. Um, so it's, it's important that, it's important that people realize how close we came to losing that theater. Um, and it's something we want to make sure that that never becomes a threat again. We, we have to maintain the, the Sanger. As you said, it's, it's, it's the grand dame of Palafox, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's important that we uh, continue to advocate for it. Um, in terms of, you know, every now and then you'll hear somebody say, well, I can't um, even afford to go into the Sanger. Um, I, I'd like to take exception to that because I think that, um, I mean, obviously it costs money to turn on the lights mm -hmm. and, and to have people come in and work and all of that, but elaborate on that. There's really something for everyone. We have things, we just recently had a naturalization ceremony. If you've never been to one of those, it's one of the most, makes you proud to be an American citizen. That was free. Our Sanger Classic Movie Series, $5. The Symphony Children's Chorus, Ballet Pensacola, they all have tickets as low as $20. That, that is an affordable evening out. Um, you know, the, the theater is good for the quality of life of Pensacola, and so many businesses move here because of Pensacola and its quality of life. But we also have a huge economic impact on the community. Um, there's a study by the Arts and Economic uh, Prosperity Group that when we plug in our numbers, the Sanger has a $3.56 million impact on Pensacola and provides 109 full-time equivalent jobs throughout the year. So that's a huge economic boost to our community for something that, you know, adds to our quality of life as well. I know so many uh, businesses that want to locate point to the Sanger mm -hmm. and some of our, our, our arts that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you see that? Do you see it as important for businesses to get in and really support the Sanger? I'll address both of you. Sure. And, and you know, you see all the time, a lot of studies will show that companies that are relocating employees, they want a strong arts and culture scene. Ironically, even if they themselves aren't going to come to a lot of these shows, there's a pride that comes with that. There's a, there's a sense that if a community has a really strong arts and culture scene and some really nice theaters and venues, that is representative of the overall health of the community um, and, and, and the appeal of the community. 
So it is very important whether you actually like the Broadway series or we go to the symphony and opera performances. Um, it's still very important for everyone in the community that we have that strong arts presence. Well, and I mean, we even have the Blue Collar Comedy Tour will show up well, every now and then. Exa I mean, Ron Wine, we've got Widespread Panic and Keb Mo uh, Blues mm -hmm. uh, Comedy. Rock, there, there really is something for everybody. Um, back to the businesses, we have some of the major employers, when they're trying to attract executives, they come and tour the theater and we tell them a little bit about what we have to offer and they use that to attract you know, high talent from other areas. I would think it's huge because mm -hmm. as we stated, you know, earlier on how important the arts are to our community. You sit in a unique perspective because you get to see all the different arts groups coming mm -hmm. into the theater. How do you see the state of the arts and, and how things are evolving and going over the next few years? With the symphony, Peter's 20th anniversary here, he has done an amazing job with them. The change in the, the children's chorus with uh, the Pote's leaving and Alex coming in, and there's a, a new direction for them. Things are very good. They're all doing well with their, their season subscription, so people are really getting out and supporting and participating in the arts. You think um, of arts, sometimes people think that it's for older people, you know. And we see people like Jonathan's a symphony subscriber, you know. They're, it's not just 65-year-old <laughs> retired people going to the Sanger. We see all ages come and all demographics coming down to the theater. Well, and look at Richard and his yeah. professional mm -hmm. dancers, They're young and vibrant and mm -hmm. here, and it's like you said, all ages. What were you gonna say? And, and along those lines, you know, Friends of the Sanger, we're trying to do a lot to get especially younger people into the theater. Mm -hmm. um, earlier this year, we had a wonderful, uh, it was actually thanks to sponsors, we were able to give a free screening of Frozen, which of course, mm -hmm all the children love, and, and it was a sing-along, and, and uh, so we were able to bring lots and lots of kids into the theater for that. Um, we also have a, a children's fund that we've established. Uh, it's actually in honor of, of Sherry. Uh, my, my, my father helped establish it a few years ago and in, in honor of all your great service and, Thank you. and, and a love for the theater and wanting to uh, help um, what you might refer to as some of the underprivileged kids in the community who might have a difficult time affording theater tickets. And so we work with a lot of great local nonprofits to connect with these children and, and help bring them in for free. We cover their ticket costs to uh, Broadway shows, uh, the ballet performances, uh, the symphonies, music for families every year. And so we're really doing a lot to try and get um, the younger people in the theater so that hopefully as they grow up, they'll keep coming. Absolutely, and Kathy will wrap things up with you just letting people know about season subscriptions and all that going on right now. Season subscriptions, uh, tickets are still on sale now. You can visit PensacolaSanger.com. Uh, tickets are as low as $215 for four shows. Wow. Yes. That's what one show will cost you. In, in New York. And if you want to go see Hamilton, forget about it. Well, yeah. <laughs> we won't have Hamilton for a while. Yeah, I think you're right. But we've got some great shows, and for a city of this size, to be able to go for even fifty or sixty dollars right. to a show, I mean, it's just incredible. Yes. Thanks for all of your great work, Thank you. Jonathan. Thanks for all of your great work, Happy and there. we're looking forward to many, many great years at the Sanger Theater. You're watching in studio, the State of the Arts Part One. When we return after this break, we'll be joined by Brett Barrow with the Pensacola Symphony Orchestra. Stay with us. We'll be back right after this.
This is In Studio on WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're talking about the state of the performing arts in our area. And now to the Pensacola Symphony Orchestra. Joining us is Brett Barrow, the executive director of the Pensacola Symphony Orchestra. Brett heads up the mission of the PSO, which is to promote the well-being of the greater Pensacola community through excellence in live symphonic music and lifelong learning through engaging musical activities. The Pensacola Symphony Orchestra was actually born in 1926 and continues to grow. We welcome Brett. Thank you so much for having me, Sherry. It's a pleasure to be here. So happy to have you here, yeah. Brett. And wow, you've got a lot of roles, actually, or a few roles within the PSO. Tell us about that. Sure. I, um, I started with the Pensacola Symphony in 2005, and I came here from Cincinnati, uh, where I did my master's degree in trombone performance. And when I came back, I, I served in a role of education uh, manager and ticket sales. Uh, so I've worked my way through that and did some fundraising for the organization. Uh, and then a few years ago, I became the executive director. Um, I also play trombone in the orchestra, which is great. I sit next to Don Stoden, who was my first trombone teacher. Um, Pensacola Symphony is the first orchestra I ever heard live. You know, wow. we're, we're still doing some of those same programs today. The fifth grade concerts um, that we do every year at the Sanger. That was my first experience in 1990, mm -hmm. uh, coming to hear the orchestra under the baton of Greer Williams at that point. So it was, you know, it's, it's been interesting to watch the orchestra evolve and grow, and it's been really a thrill for me to be part of that. Wow, talk about family and community and mm -hmm. sense. I mean, you just kind of embody all of that. Well, it, it's really an honor to, to serve the orchestra of your hometown, and uh, I feel really privileged to do that. And uh, I have some great colleagues, and you know, we couldn't do it without an amazing board. Uh, and all the, the support we have from our patrons and the community has been really just mind-blowing. Well, so then if it was literally born in 1926, um, that makes it your 90th year. Yeah, we're, we're about to start our 91st season. Um, I don't remember the first few, but you know, the last <laughs> 10 or so I, I, can, I can tell you more about. Um, but the orchestra has come a long way. You know, we're, we're a regional orchestra, which means we pull in musicians from all over the Southeast uh, to perform. A lot of people think we're based here uh, as far as every musician living here. We're actually about half from Pensacola. And the other half come from you know, Tallahassee, Hattiesburg, New Orleans, even Atlanta or farther away. Um, and we put together orchestras based on the pieces we perform. So basically, you know, a piece by Mozart may need a, a smaller number of musicians than a piece by Mahler. Um, but we do both, and we do both really well, and we, that's our foundation. We really, you know, love bringing in the musicians and love having to, you know, try to cre and keep increasing the artistic quality of what we do. And do you see that musicians that come from other places, they get excited about coming to Pensacola? They do, and I think Peter is a large part of that, Peter Rubart, our music director. Um, this is gonna be his 20th anniversary season, and you know, he's he's definitely the anchor. He, he, he brings the musicians in. They love to play the pieces he programs. They love to work with him. He's got such a great rapport with them. Um, but he also holds them to very high standards, so I think they enjoy that challenge as well. Um, but yeah, I, I do see that the musicians love to come here and play. We treat them very well. Our community embraces them. We have full houses at the Sanger, and it's been a, just a, an amazing thing since the renovation to have that support from the community. And it's just, you know, I think that's really how we have you know, achieved where we are today is because of the, that renovation and going forward. Well, tell us what it was like before the renovation and then what it was like after the renovation at the Sanger and why it's important for people to support those kinds of um, uh, renovations. Well, I think, you know, the, fundamentally for us, the, the, the seats and everything are obviously more comfortable. The amenities are better at the Sanger uh, post-renovation. That's definitely a great thing for the audience. Um, the number of seats have, have uh, uh, decreased a bit, which actually is is both advantageous for the size of the seat and also for for us in filling up the house. Um, but I think you know the biggest thing for us um, was when it truly became a concert hall. It, we we installed an, an acoustic shell that helps the sound of the orchestra go into the hall. We, we are totally an acoustic uh, ensemble. We don't have amplified sound, so we're dependent on that natural environment. And it was totally enhanced by what happened through the renovation. Uh, and continues to be, again, the bedrock on which we build. Well, um, I believe we actually had acousticians come in mm -hmm. and, and 
they paid attention to that. And they tuned the hull, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they were able to adjust some angles and things on the, on the shell itself and come up with the optimum situation so that every seat in the house has great sound. And um, so you can't really have a bad seat. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. the goal. And mm -hmm. so now you're, in addition to being in the Sanger, though, you're really getting out and in the community quite a lot. Right. We, we have taken on um, sort of a, a, a posture that says, you know, we feel like we do um, some great things on the stage. But by its very nature, what we do in the concert hall is a little bit limiting. Um, you can't always fit the whole community in the, on, the, on the stage of the Sanger, but it's great when you can bring music into the community and share it in new ways. So we're all about you know, the musical culture of the community and identifying needs within the community. We took on a project about two, almost two years ago now where we did a survey of various constituents throughout the community, businesses, uh, political leaders, uh, community members, teachers. Um, we talked to people in healthcare. Just a lot of different voices uh, in, in, the, in the mix. And what we came to was uh, the realization that we should be using music to serve needs. So thinking of music a little bit differently rather than just a performing art, but also an art that serves. And so we've come up with um, a plan. We call it Beyond the Stage. Um, this is our, our new approach to community engagement. And we've worked with several pilot partners uh, in different locations in the community to bring music to where people are. Um, we work in healthcare settings. We bring music to Nemours Clinic, uh, Nemours Children's Specialty Care, mm -hmm. as well as Sacred Heart Children's Hospital. Um, you know, the need that they articulated to us was, you know, our patients are anxious, our families are anxious. What can you do to help us with that anxiety? We don't want to have to medicate the kids. So we've we've come up with programs wow. that come in and address that need. You know, we have, uh, and it's a lifelong spectrum too. We, we go from that to schools and, and different things throughout the community, but we also serve people uh, in retirement communities, in, in art galleries downtown, in uh, various places like that. And we also serve in, in, even in hospice, you know, touching people with music, um, is important at all points of life, and we realize that, and we've heard that from the community, so we're responsive to those needs. And we want to continue to build that program, uh, and, and rather than being a, a, an organization that's about exposing people to music, we want to engage people with music. That's really incredible, and um, I want to tell the audience that I asked, did the symphony have any specific needs, and you, you kind of turned that over, and you said... Yeah, well, I, I see it that we I mean, we have needs, obviously, um, but our organization doesn't exist because we have needs. We exist to serve needs. Um, we see the community um, as our partner in this. We, we're we're going to try to match the growth of this community. We want to say, you know, if, if we're truly doing our job, we're serving the needs that are present in Pensacola. So we're working hard to identify those, um, and we love the conversations that come up through this process. Um, but that's really our, that's how we're going to view it going forward, is we want to be part of this great thing we call Pensacola and really work with the community to serve any of those needs we can through music. I just love that because if we're serving others, then it's it's all it all works and and it's just a, a, a roundabout. Yeah, we totally believe that if, if we're doing the right things for the right reasons, we're going to see that support come and we have so far uh, and I'm, I'm fully um, in, of, the, of the mind that, that we'll continue to see that. No question. So let's talk about this fabulous upcoming season and what yeah. people can expect. Well, we've, we've raised the bar a little bit this year. It's Peter's 20th anniversary, as I mentioned before. So we've got some great, exciting things going on. Uh, we have uh, our opening nights, October the 1st. Um, so we're going to start off with a Razzle Dazzle concert, which we always do, uh, that first concert. We're bringing in a fantastic young uh, violin soloist, Bella Hristova. She's going to play the Sibelius Violin Concerto, and we've got some great pieces there by Ravel, WC, uh, and Dvorak as well. You know, we move into um, some pr performances in uh, November. Um, we have a, a new thing we've added on October. Uh, November the 3rd, which is a Thursday, we call it on stage, and we actually have the audience seated on stage oh, at the Sanger, uh, and then, then later that weekend we play uh, a Masterworks concert featuring a gold medalist from the Van Cliburn Piano Competition and Alexander Cobran, uh, and then actually that Sunday we're at the Great Gulf Coast Arts Festival, so it's a big big week for us, and the fifth grade youth concerts are also that week, wow. so we just sandwich a lot <laughs> in that, that week. Um, if you go into December, we have our New Year's Eve concert, which is always a fantastic time. It's the only concert this year that starts at 7 o'clock uh -huh. uh, to get people out of there a little bit early. Um, most of the other concerts we do start at 7.30. So we have just a great season. I, mm -hmm. I will mention a couple more highlights for you just real sure, quick. Sure, sure. The, the March concert mm -hmm. um, is, is probably the epitome of, wow. um, of what orchestral work can be. And it's going to be Mahler's Symphony Number no. 3. 
It's a 90-minute piece, so it's a long piece, but it's a fantastic piece. It's, the, it's one of the greatest symphonies that Mahler wrote. Um, might be one of the best pieces in the, in the literature. And it's a piece that orchestras our size normally don't stage. It just takes too many forces. It takes too much extra rehearsal and too many commitments from other organizations. We have choruses from the University of West Florida as well as the Children's Chorus that are going to be partnering with us on that performance. Um, and it's just a massive undertaking. And we're just and that's going to be definitely a pinnacle of the year for us. And if viewers didn't catch all of those, they can certainly go onto your website and learn more about that. Yes. Tell me about some of people's first time experiences. People might not know if they like symphony. A lot of the people are watching, they're seasoned subscribers. Mm -hmm. Somebody might not really know. What kind, of, what kind of feelings do you get from people when they experience that? I think what we do, um, we try to make music accessible. Um, I think a lot of people do put up barriers about what they perceive a symphony to be or what they should, you know, the experience might be. It's a little, a little tight. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily fit in with what they see as a casual evening. Um, I think our, the, what we do is, is make that music possible for everybody, both from a price standpoint, but also, you know, you don't have to wear you know, anything in particular to do that. We have everything from blue jeans to whatever, you know, it's, it's all part of the experience. Um, I think Peter does an amazing job of articulating, you know, what is special about the music um, from stage in these concerts, and it makes everything just feel a little bit more connected, and I think people really enjoy that experience. He is like the connector between the, the orchestra and the audience. It's just right. amazing. It's just like... We, it, it's about musical culture. We mm -hmm. want to bridge that gap between community, uh, music, and the musicians. We want to make sure that's accessible to everybody. So happy 20th to uh, Peter this right. year. That's right. And you'll be out and about in the community. We'll look forward to the Gulf Coats Arts Festival. And thanks for all the great work that you're doing getting into, oh my goodness, hospice and children. And the oh, it's just amazing. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate I think that. it's great. Thank you, Brett. And we'll look forward to the season coming up. Thanks. Well, we hope you've enjoyed learning more about our vibrant performing arts community in part one of our series on the arts here along the Gulf Coast. We do appreciate all of our guests this evening from the Pensacola Children's Chorus, Ballet Pensacola, the Broadway series at the Sanger Theater, and the Pensacola Symphony Orchestra. Incredible organizations with fabulous stories to tell. Visit all of their websites. I sincerely hope that you'll have a chance to enjoy some of their amazing performances. And I strongly encourage you to attend the 2016 Great Gulf Coast Arts Festival coming up this fall. The festival is one of the best regarded, most popular arts festivals in the whole U.S. It's happening this year, uh, the weekend of November 4th, 5th, and 6th at Seville Square in downtown Pensacola. It is a juried art show, and it features some 200 of the nation's best artists in all mediums, painting, jewelry, sculpting, graphic arts, and much, much more. There's music from the symphony and others, children's art, dancing, heritage crafts, food, spirits, and activities just too numerous to list tonight. Admission is free, and the festival is always a highlight of the arts calendar each year here along the Gulf Coast. So be sure to check the website for hours for that festival. And on my next edition of In Studio, State of the Arts Part 2, coming up on Thursday, November 10th, we'll be talking with Pat Bush, the 2016 chair of the Great Gulf Coast Arts Fest, for a wrap of this year's show and a look ahead to next year. We'll also be joined by many other representatives of Pensacola's prolific arts community. Until then, I'm Sherry Hemminghouse Weeks. I do hope you'll tune in November 10th for part two, and be sure to check out the next edition of In Studio on September 22nd. Ramika Vincent Leary will host a program on healthy kids and healthy choices. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you soon on In Studio or maybe in your own backyard. Take care.